<laughs> huh? Uh, you ready now? All right. Now we're in. Hey, welcome to Fireside Tats. My name is Jake. This is the official podcast of the Tattoo Improvement Network. And we're this is our first interview, actually, of the... Um, Oh shit! Ink and Iron, <laughs> the Ink and Iron Fest <laughs> in Nashville. <laughs> there's, there's nothing. I'm looking around to see what says it. Uh, we we podcasted a week or two ago with Russ Abbott, and his shop is Ink and Dagger. And after when we left, I was thinking we were planning for this fest, and I was thinking the whole time, like, did I call Ink and Dagger Ink and Iron that entire time? But I went back and looked, and I didn't. So uh, I'm here with Ty Pelota, uh, tattoo artist, illustrator. And uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about uh, about his background, about uh, his process, and you know stuff wherever wherever the conversation takes us. Where are you um, where are you out of? Where are you based from? It's outside of Long Beach Island, New Jersey. It's Manahawken. Oh, okay. okay. Small town coming into the main main like beach town basically. Oh. Yeah. Do you um, do you travel a lot to do a lot of shows? Um, we have been the last couple of years. Yeah, just yeah. trying to get out there. Uh, nowadays, just going to a city that you want to visit yeah. and doing a show to make it. You know, a good excuse to get to that right. city seems reasonable right. for me. Yeah, that's but, what we uh, do. That's right. Um, have you been Have you been down here before, Nashville? First, first trip? time, Nashville. Yeah. Yeah, we're from Memphis, uh, so we're we're pretty familiar with the. We were town, in Memphis but, once. Yeah. Oh, really? Passed through on our way to Austin. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a cool city. Yeah, yeah. I like I like Memphis. It's nice. Um, it doesn't have quite the tattoo scene that even Nashville or definitely Austin uh, yeah. has. It's um, uh, still a fairly small tattoo town, although it's it's expanding, but it's not expanding like um, uh, really like art focused tattooing like a lot of other cities are. You just have right. shops pop up and go away, pop up and go away. So how long have you been tattooing? Uh, 1998. Okay. Yeah. It's a good while. Yeah. Um, and you uh, uh, got started. You mentioned before we started talking that you were not an art school kid. You started. You were already drawing, obviously. Yeah, yeah, a drawing since I'm a kid, yeah. um, just natural ability. Yeah. Uh, wish I had that opportunity for art school, like we were talking about before. But um, I've learned most of what I've done trial and error, mm -hmm. and a little bit from working with other people here and there as well. Yeah. Um, never really had a true formal apprenticeship. Started to, hmm. one of them wasn't worthwhile at all. The other one was a pretty bad scene as well. Unfortunately, some people get a great opportunity, and um, I wasn't given either of those. So I kind of like forced my way into the business, you know, yeah. taking opportunities where I could get them and. Well, that's, that says a lot then, because you've owned your own shop since 04, you said? Yeah. Okay. Well, so a lot transpired from 98 till then. Yeah. Right. Sounds like Probably it was. Probably worked in about you know, seven, eight shops minimum. Mm. Yeah. So just learn what I can, move on, learn what I can, move on. So huh. So did you open the shop just out of necessity? You couldn't find a place that you were satisfied with, or you were interested um, in running no, a business? No, actually, um, it, it, it worked out for me that um, I, I worked a construction job early on mm. from a uh, mid-90s on up and then 98 when I started tattooing um, until 2003 I still work construction and tattooed part-time uh, and then from you know 2004 um, sorry 2003 the last two shops I worked in full-time before I opened my own were um, local shops I'm still friendly with a lot of the guys in the last shop I worked in um, it was just the opportunity arose for me I had the annuity funds saved huh. up from the construction job to, to be able to do my own thing so huh. How was that transition from just being a tattooer to having to run a business? It, it was pretty crazy, man. I mean, I had some help from my wife. She's pretty much the business operator oh, okay. at the time. She, she got me going a, a lot of the way, and mm. I just did the tattoos more or less. I, I can't say from the business aspect yeah. that, that I'm much of a business owner. Right. I do my best. The people that work for me now, though, that she's moved on and opened her own business, people that are with me now love to work with me because I'm just pretty laid back. Yeah, anything yeah. goes as long as it's the right thing, you know. <laughs> right, so. right. Well, that I, I think that happens a lot. That people will, you know, they're like, "Adam, I'm splitting commissions with this shop. I'm having to work these set hours, and I'm just going to work on my own. I'm going to open a private studio. Or I'm going to open a, my own shop." And then they find like, "Oh wow, I just took on nine new jobs. I'm yeah. not just a tattooer anymore." Well, that's the truth. It does take some time out of you. But I have a family as well and two kids. And at the time, they were really young. So one of the main reasons for opening my own shop was not being stuck in a shop till 2 a.m. Right. I worked in some pretty late shops. Um, at first, we opened the business uh, 12 to 9, and then through the years, I bumped it back to 10 to 6. Then we got rid of Saturdays, and uh. now that I have more people in, in the crew, we're back to 11 to 7, 7 days. Um, but it's great hours for me to be able to go home and eat dinner with my family, yeah. you know, which, which I didn't have working for anybody because I was always the low man working on everybody else's shop. Right. So I got what everyone else didn't want, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's tough. How many artists do you have now? Uh, it's four of us, okay. including myself, so it's a small okay. shop. Yeah. Yeah. Three stations and one person floats between the stations on the day off. So, okay. 
Um, we're we're probably dropping images of uh, of some of Ty's work as we're um, as we're talking here, but. Um, Kind of a, a lot of color work. You said you worked used to work it more in realism and have moved to, towards more of an illustrative yeah, uh, style yeah, lately. What, what seemed to give me some recognition was painting reproductions, famous mm. people's paintings. I've done yeah. a bunch of Esau, Esau Andrews reproductions yeah. and stuff, and um, that created something for me, and people wanted realism. And in my area, there weren't a lot of people that wanted to even mess with realism, so I, I built a client base that way. But I got stuck in such a rut where... Even though it, you know, it takes a technical ability, I felt like here I am every day just being a reproduction guy. Like, where's, where am I? Right. Where, where do I fit into all this as an artist, you know? Yeah. And for me, it was, I've always felt like I was missing out on having a definitive style where you looked at certain people's artwork and you knew it was there as the second you laid eyes on it. Mm. So now I'm tending to lean more towards illustrated realism you know, and illustrated work in general, yeah. where anything that I could do myself, I try to draw a lot on with Sharpies when, it, when it's something that can be drawn successfully with Sharpie. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to take the easy way out. If something requires a lot of time, I'll do a drawing first. Right. But I feel, um, I feel alive. I feel excited when I do my own work versus you know, the stress of dealing with realism. Yeah. yeah, and it is. That is stressful. Um, we talked a little bit before, the, uh, before we started shooting the, about some of these watching some of these super talented photorealistic artists and I, you look at their stencils and you look at their preparation and you just go god it looks like a job that looks like so much work yeah. and it's so much fun to break out sharpies and to let something kind of evolve as and 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 you can yeah. kind of map to the body and and, and it makes it so much easier and so much more fun yeah uh, some of my japanese work it's it's all large oversized sharpie work and mm -hmm. um one of my influences for that was jeff gogue oh yeah um i did a boston tattoo conference and one thing he talked about was overshooting the canvas do things as large as you can mm. and um, it really works for me with the Japanese especially um, you know fitting it to the body whereas I do a dragon that goes from the shoulder down past the elbow and it's just the dragon's head the only way you're gonna get a fit like that is with drawing it right on right. and it's a lot of fun and I don't mind that part of the process I'll, I'll come in at start at nine o'clock in the morning draw on somebody for two plus hours before we get going for the yeah. day it's worth it man. You know, yeah, it's absolutely. a long ass day but it's definitely worth it right yeah I, um, I've never seen Jeff uh, talk in person but I own that uh, the DVD that he put out not long ago um, I forget what it's called tattoo some tattoo as i see it tattoo as i see it yeah, yeah. Uh, and he talks a little bit about that yeah, like you know if someone just wants to yeah. they want to drag on their shoulder blade i'll just talk them into getting the head and like maybe yeah. we'll do the body later or something yeah. and overshooting the the canvas i think is is such an important thing and it allows you to to really draw to the body a lot yeah i haven't had a chance to see that video yet myself and kind of embarrassed to say that because yeah. he's one of my influences so yeah it's um, good it's good it's um just um that, that whole thing in general that they set up with that conference, is seeing him, seeing Nick Baxter, Nico Hurtado, everybody yeah. up front, you know, just laying it out on the table for you. It's it's really, it's it's different than the normal scene where people kind of hold secrets to themselves. Yeah. These guys are there and they're excited to talk about what they've accomplished because do, doing it yourself, you know, how much hard work and how many long hours go into that kind of thing. So to see these guys at this level so humble and willing to share it's kind of cool it yeah. really is and you having tattooed since the late 90s i started in 96 and so you saw a lot of the you've seen a lot of the transition that was not yeah. the case at, at that point in time it was such a secret society uh, it was so hard to get very, information from very people. unwelcoming man yeah. as a matter of fact um my first opportunity in uh, point pleasant new jersey for an apprenticeship just wasn't working out i was paying towards the apprenticeship and I was just giving my money to the guy and not learning anything after a yeah. couple of months of it. I, I bounced out to Austin, Texas, and I got a different apprenticeship out there. Uh, that one got you out on the floor tattooing people in a week's time with this crash course. It, wow. it was it was rough, but wow. it, it was a rough go of it. Sitting uh, there nervous trying to tattoo people with, you know, a shop full of apprentices. It was another, um, you know, I guess you could say unprofessional apprenticeship, yeah. but it, it got my feet wet. and. You know, moving from there back to Staten Island and then back to New Jersey, like bouncing around from shop to shop, the most I've ever gotten out of it was learning from other people who were willing to share more so than the formal apprenticeship that you're supposed to pay money for and all that, you know. Yeah. And um, for me, just keep moving along, pick up a little bit here and there is what did it. And um, I have no regrets, man. Whether the business was hard on me, wouldn't let me in, you know, and had to fight my way in, I feel like um, one of the reasons I've done so well and become what I've become is because nobody handed me shit, you know? Yeah. So I'm grateful for the fight. Yeah. And it makes me appreciate where I am today. Yeah, yeah, that's well said. I've, I've, I agree that 
I, I watch apprentices or people getting into the business now, and I, and I, oh, we just podcasted with someone a couple of weeks ago, a Russ Abbott's apprentice that looks, he's been tattooing like a year, and I was like, God, I couldn't do these tattoos six years in. I mean, you've got yeah. such a head start, but then you think back and you go, man, whatever, we, we we earned it. We, it was it was a lot harder. Uh, it was a lot harder road at that point for a lot of people. You know, you didn't have guys. It didn't make any sense to go to art school and yeah. to become a tattooer. No one did that at that point. Now you have yeah. people that are really like classically trained artists, and they're and they're coming straight into tattooing out of art school. And I mean, of course, it's done wonders for the business, uh, for the industry. But um, but there's something to be, to be said for for what both you and I did. Yeah, I, I feel like these days, uh, you know, for me, it's a fight to evolve, to stay up with where things are going yeah. day after day. Because yeah. I look back at some people that I started with in the 90s and all day long, they're still doing that 90s tattoo. And it's like, man, you're still doing your work. It is your artwork, but you're still where you were. 1998, 2000, where all the rest of us have really been fighting to try to keep up, you know? Yeah. And it is a struggle to keep up because I see some of this work and I've got people I follow on Instagram that are, you know, tattooing 14 months, 15 yeah. months, and they're fucking killing it. Man. Yeah. So yeah, it's amazing. It's inspirational yeah. um, and it's motivating. <laughs> it is. It is a little frustrating at yeah. times, but yeah. Um, I, I I completely agree, and we I come from a shop where we were the first custom shop in in our town, and so we had a nice client base and um, and we made the mistake, kind of the group of us made the mistake of not evolving with the times we didn't yeah. we were slow to get online. we kind of uh, we went to conventions and things in the late nineties and early two thousands, but then as everyone got into their forties and they were just like, eh, I don't really want to do that one this year. And so yeah. then you find yourself just in your little world doing the same tattoos on the same people. And the next thing you know, you look up and you're like, wow, everyone got a lot better than me. Everyone yeah. evolved. Yeah. <laughs> so it's hard to, it, or it's easy to fall into that rut. Oh, very easy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's definitely a struggle. And for me to be tattooing as long as I am and to be so humble about, man, these young guys are fucking kicking my ass, dude. Uh, I got to stay on it. Right. And right. I do. I just keep trying to evolve and keep, you know, keep trying to keep up. Yeah. And my, my, my thing is I'm always saying, hey, man, I'm just trying to stay relevant. I don't want to end up that guy that's still doing the 90s tattoos. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's that's enough to keep you motivated. So where do you see um, going from from here? You like the kind of illustrative style that you're doing? I, you... I do like the illustrated style. Um, one of the things that I guess uh, would be good for me to talk about is how in recent times I've been in the same area now long enough to see what some of the tattoos I've been doing early on are holding up like. I've learned where people are always saying, use more black, use more line work. And right. it does hold up true. Even if you're going to do a realistic tattoo or something with a little bit of line work, it all has to have gray shading, uh, black shading undertones, even if you're going to run some color over it. Right. Uh, the only thing that's going to be left there after your lighter colors fade is those undertones to hold the dimension. Otherwise, everything flattens out as it falls apart. So I'm using um, a lot of like medium gray through most of the tattoo hmm. to, to set the depth before I even run the color back over. Over it. And the color, some of the lighter colors will take on a different tone, but they'll still have depth, you know, without having to go, say, from dark red out to yellow. And you can just put a little gray in there, and then you're going to get a deeper yellow orange before you hit your yellow. But um, to me, that's what holds that 3D. That's what holds your shape, your dimension. Yeah. And that's so valuable to be able to see your work years down the road and oh, see man, what worked and what didn't. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I remember talking to Nick Baxter about that, and he said, you know, I started seeing this work that I was that was coming back, and, I, and he's like, and I was glazing and building these textures over like four and five sittings. He's, he said, and I noticed after a while, after maybe three or four years, anything over that third pass, that third layer of whatever, laying these deep purples or punching this area, is like, it was all just for nothing. It's like mm -hmm. nothing, none of it was there anymore. So all these subtle little... Um, textural effects that looked so nice you know a month in were just basically gone uh yeah. after a period of time and there's uh there's, there's a lot of value in being able to see what worked what didn't uh over a long period of time absolutely i mean we we came up in a time where it went from um classic traditional american traditional to this kind of you know guy atchison bringing in yeah. all this crazy biomech shit yeah. um you know, realism coming into play, the color portraits coming into play for the first time. Yeah. So there was no old timer to tell us with a color portrait, hey man, this needs a better foundation or this shit's not going to last. Right. So we're the guys that had to, you know, learn from all those mistakes to set it to where it is now. So, the, the, you know, the ideal thing would be any of these young guys who are coming out of art school formally trained. 
the shit that they can do with a painting or on paper is still not going to translate to tattoo. So they could learn from people like us who made those mistakes and say, all right, look, I need to back this shit with some black. I yeah. need to throw some gray midtones in there. Even if I'm using some gray lines in places just to hold things together as those lighter colors start to fall apart. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and that's, that's one way we can keep pushing forward without hitting that same thing again, forward and back, forward and back, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's a delicate balance because you have people that, um, like you say, that are formally trained and they might be great painters, but learning how to make their work tattooable is a, is a process. And, but then you also want to see those people pushing boundaries and say, okay, what, you know, there, there are things that people yeah. are doing now that I would have said, well, that's not tattooable. You couldn't make that work. I would yeah. have said that in the late, late nineties and they are yep. doing it and they're making I, it oh, work. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of a fine line to walk of how far can you push, uh, these painterly effects and, uh, and, yeah. and how much structure do you really have to have, uh, an underlying structure in the, uh, in the artwork. Um, well, cool, man. I know you've got to start tattooing here in just a few minutes. Um, Best way for people to find you for appointments? Triple seven tattoos dot com. Seven 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 tattoos dot com. Okay. And on Instagram you are Ty Palata. At Ty Palata. At Ty Palata. Cool. Thanks a lot, man. Hey man. All right. Thank you, bro. All right.